Today I'm going to show you how to make this awesome visual effect shot all within inside of Blender. Like always, if you want to work along with us, I have everything that I use, including my Blender file, for you to download down below. Before we get started, I just want to say a big thanks to all my patrons. If you are interested and want to see all the perks that I offer, you can see the link down in the description below. But let's go ahead and hop into this tutorial. Now I don't have a ton of time today, so this is going to be more of a fast-paced tutorial. Uh, let's go ahead and motion track everything, so VFX and motion tracking. Then let's open up our clip. Now I went ahead and converted my video to a image sequence, so I'm going to hit A and open the clip. Uh, now some things that we do have to change. First of all, let's set the scene frames and prefetch our footage just to get smoother playback. And then we got to uh, change our color management to standard since we're working with a video clip. Uh, now let's go ahead and come over here, match the previous frame, normalize, and in the tracking settings lecture, I'm going to put my correlation to a 0.9. These are kind of just all these settings that uh, you are supposed to be doing inside of camera tracking, regardless of, you know, kind of what clip that you're, uh, you know, going to be uh, playing around with. So let's go ahead and uh, the default settings over here are totally fine for me. I'm going to detect some features. Let's uh, get some more features in my scene. So 0.01 threshold, a distance of an 80. Uh, should be good enough for my scene. Let's control T, uh, track those forward, and then let's do a set of markers at the very end of my footage. So control shift T, and that should track it backwards. And now that we have markers at the beginning and end, I also like to have a set in the middle. So let's go to the middle frame, detect some features, control T, track those forward. Let's go back to that frame and control shift T to track those backwards. So now we basically have uh, tracking uh, markers in the beginning, uh, end, and middle of our clip, uh, just three sets there. And so that'll give us a lot of information uh, for Blender to go ahead and get a nice camera track. And I do want to go ahead and delete some of these outliers right here. And so you might see some of these green uh, kind of things are going a little bit haywire. You do, do want to just kind of delete any outliers that are kind of poking its head up and down uh, in both the red and the green areas. Um, but of course, we are going to let Blender kind of do uh, most of the heavy lifting. But it's always just nice to uh, kind of, you know, get all of uh, the visual outliers out. Okay, so now we have to solve our uh, camera track. Uh, now for the A and B keyframe, that's the frame range where it's going to be the most. I believe a uh, 100 to 140 is what I have. Uh, you know, with our testing or whatever, this is where our camera moves the most in that frame range. Let's go ahead and refine everything right here and solve the camera motion. Okay, so you can see our first solve error is at 2.11, so that's actually pretty decent. Let's try to get that lower. So I'm going to go over to clean, clean tracks, and then I'm going to push this reprojection error up until we're just selecting some of the highest error tracks, and then we can just delete everything, and we're going to resolve our camera motion. You can see that's automatically gotten our solve error way down, so I'm going to go ahead and do that a couple more times just to get that as low as possible. So I cleaned it up a couple more times and was able to get down to a 0.2 solve error, so that's what I'm going to stick with for this scene. Let's go ahead and set up the tracking scene. So right click, join the areas here, and then let's set the background and tracking scene right there. Of course, we do have to define where our floor is, and that's super easy since we have a ton of points on our floor. So I'm just going to select like three points right there. Let's define our floor plane, and that is looking pretty accurate. Uh, let's now go ahead and determine our origin. So I'm going to select this point to be my origin, and then this point, uh, since it's kind of in that up and down axis, is going to be my X axis. And so now that I have the rotation and also our floor plane uh, defined, I also want to set the scale of my scene. And so if I uh, kind of look down here, if I'm thinking about how it is in the real uh, world, um, this and this point are about, you know, let's say 11 inches away from each other. And so what we have to do is convert 11 inches into meters. And so that conversion, I believe, is like a, a 2.8 uh, or sorry, a 0.28 meters. And so we can go ahead and set that here. So uh, with these two points selected, we can hit set scale. And then I want to put a 0.28 right there. And uh, that'll give us a pretty rough uh, guesstimation of the scale seen. So now that we're done with this, let's come out to the layout tab. And I want to go ahead and delete some of the stuff that Blender automatically set up, like the foreground uh, collection and uh, background collection. Then we can also delete the background view layer and compositing. I'm just going to delete these four nodes since we're not really going to have to deal with uh, any lens distortion or anything like that. So let's delete that and plug our movie clip into the alpha. Ohm. And so this is uh, kind of the basic, you know, compositing scene inside of Blender. Let's come back out to the layout tab. And uh, I'm just going to start some from scratch. So let's delete everything besides our camera. And then if we come inside here, what I do want to do is go into the camera properties. And I like to uh, play around with the background images because as you can see right here, we're having some distortion. And that's actually to do with uh, when we told Blender to refine our uh, lens distortion. So I want to turn that off. So uh, render undistorted right there. I want to turn that off. And then let's just go ahead and increase the opacity all, all the way up to one. 
So let's go ahead and test our uh, camera track, make sure it's accurate. So what I'm going to do is uh, select a mesh cube, and then let's go ahead and come into edit mode by hitting tab. I'm going to select everything and G, Z, uh, control, uh, click that up one unit, just so our origin point is on the ground. Uh, so now that we know uh, that is on the ground, uh, we can see that wherever we scale it, our cube is always going to remain on our ground. And so with that, we can kind of scrub throughout here, and you will see that our cube is uh, following our floor perfectly. So now we are actually ready to start setting up our scene. Uh, so first thing I want to do is let's go uh, change our render engine. So I'm going to come over here. Uh, by default, it's on EV. We need to set that to cycles to get more um, accurate lighting. So uh, with GPU compute selected, if you do have a dedicated graphics, I highly recommend you guys come over to edit preferences and enable optics if you have an RTX card, since that is going to give us a lot more uh, render capabilities. Uh, so now that we have that, let's come to the rendered view. I want to notice that we don't see our background footage anymore. So let's go to the render properties. I want to change a uh, film back to transparent, just so we actually have transparency in my scene. And of course, uh, we have no lighting in the scene. Uh, now, since this is kind of a, you know, evenly lit, kind of shot i'm not really going to deal with any hgris or uh, any you know area lamps or anything like that let's go ahead and just go to world properties and i'm going to increase the color uh, to somewhere like that um, let's go up a little bit more and then we'll set the strength a little bit higher until it's basically uh, somewhere like that where it's uh, kind of this white uh, color right here and so that all is looking good. What I do want to go ahead and do is um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, define where we actually want our pool and everything to kind of, you know, reveal itself and stuff there. So uh, what I can do is let's uh, S, I'm going to invert this. So if you just kind of, you know, uh, move your mouse the opposite way, it'll actually invert itself. And so now uh, if we come to the side view, you'll see that our top face is basically on the floor right here. And so that is actually really nice uh, because what we can do is let's S and then uh, X to scale it on that. And what I basically want to do is uh, put, position my uh, pool where exactly where I want it to be. And so this is kind of where I want my pool object. So let's go ahead and separate out the different object uh, from the top uh, since we're going to have the top basically come out and reveal itself. And so uh, with this, let's go ahead and inside of uh, edit mode, I'm just selecting this top face and that's hit P to separate by selection. So with that, we basically have two new objects now, or sorry, one new object um, that we have created. So let's name this one. I'm just going to name this top and then this one we're going to name bottom. And so, of course, um, these are the, uh, you know, specific ones. So bottom is kind of just a little thing right here. You can see that it's basically um, just a cube uh, object. And then the top is the actual top face. Of course, if I do kind of bring it out here, you will see that the top face is, um, you know, a 2D plane. And so we actually need to go ahead and extrude that a little bit to uh, give it some actual 3D, uh, you know, feeling and geometry and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to undo uh, my thing so it's on the exact uh, kind of, you know, floor plane of our scene. Let's go into the edit mode, and then I'm going to hit E to extrude that down, and we'll give it a little bit of thickness right there. So now if I bring it up, you can see it's actually a 3D object in itself. Uh, so at, all that is looking good. Uh, what we do uh, notice if I come to the camera view now is that we can actually see this side of our box, and so we actually need to uh, add a object in order to occlude that. And so that's super easy. Let's actually select our top um, thing right here. And we're going to use this face um, to actually make a new object. So let's go ahead and shift D. I'm going to duplicate this face. Uh, so it's basically a new uh, you know, face. If we right click, it'll actually go back to its original position. So with that, let's go ahead and separate by selection again. And now we have this top 001. Uh, this is going to be our holdout. And so I'm just going to name that holdout. And what we can do now is I want to go into the holdout and go into edit mode there. Let's hit A to select all of the faces and stuff here. Then I'm going to hit E and then S to uh, scale out the uh, extrusion. And so that's basically created a whole new uh, you know mess of stuff. We need to go ahead and delete the face that it automatically created. So I'm going to hit X and then uh, delete the face right there. And so now we basically have uh, this object with uh, some you know uh, data and geometry out here. I do want to go ahead and delete this middle thing since we actually do want to see inside of that uh, for the pool and also our uh, top object that we made. So let's go ahead and hit X and delete the face. And now we basically have a uh, kind of hole cut out into the middle here, and it's perfectly on top of our uh, top object right here. 
Uh, so that is looking good. Let's go ahead and set that as a holdout. So if I come over here to the object properties, we can go down to visibility. I'm just going to make the mask a holdout here. And so what that allows us to do is now uh, a holdout is basically just telling whatever is rendering behind it, I want to be transparent. And so now we actually don't see uh, the bottom of our thing here. And so it's giving us that kind of illusion that there is a hole in our table like that. Uh, so that is looking good. Let's go ahead and deal with the texture on the top because we actually have this white texture right here. Uh, so I'm going to bring a new window out here and let's just go ahead and uh, make this a shader editor. I'm going to hit in to hide this little panel over here. Um, and then let's go ahead and uh, I want to add a new material. Now, the first material that I'm going to add is going to be the material uh, for, uh, you know, what's underneath of that. If I actually come uh, through on my clip, you'll see that this table right here is a little bit of black right here. So I just want to make my first material that black material. Uh, so let's come over here to the material properties. I'm going to add a new material. Of course, I'm just going to name this one black um, like that. And then uh, if we play around with this, you can see it's basically affecting the entire object. So if I make it a little bit black, uh, you know, the entire object is black now. Of course, we do want to have two materials for this object. So it's super simple to uh, make this top material have its own uh, kind of material to it. So let's go ahead and hit plus over here to add a new material. I'm going to name this one, um, you know, top We'll name it footage uh, since we're going to be projecting our footage onto that. And so that is looking pretty good. Um, let's go ahead and tell it um, which material goes to which face. So if we come to edit mode over here, I can select this top face and you'll see that black is automatically selected because that's the material that uh, we first applied. Uh, it's going to apply it to all the geometry ever seen. So we actually need to manually tell which geometry is, uh, you know, going to which material. So what I can do is with that top face selected, let's select the top footage uh, material over here and then hit assign. And now uh, what that's done is it basically has assigned uh, this specific geometry to be uh, this top footage uh, material that we have. And so that is exactly what we want. Now we have the uh, two materials that we can play around with separately. And so let's go ahead and deal with the top face and, you know, make sure uh, we actually project the texture onto it so we can actually raise that out of the ground. Uh, now I do want to define kind of where I want my uh, ground to start. And I believe at frame 10, I want the actual animation to start where it rises up and, you know, reveals the hole underneath it. So in order to do that, let's delete the principal BSDF uh, since we don't want any lighting or shadows uh, to be baked into uh, the actual material. Uh, then we're going to open up uh, ship day, add a image texture. So with that image texture, let's go ahead and open up. And again, I selected frame 10 for mine. And so what we can do is uh, go to that frame range in our image sequence. So right here, frame 10, I'm just going to open up that in image. And if we plug the color into the surface, we're basically having this result. And this is uh, basically the UV of our uh, you know, material and stuff like that. And so, of course, what we do have to do is uh, come up here. First, let's enable an add-on. So edit preferences add-ons. And then if you type in node, uh, this is a add-on that comes default with Blender. It's the node wrangler add-on. And so you just want to make sure you have that checked and installed. And with that, we can hold uh, with this uh, image texture selected. Let's uh, hold Control and T, and that will add a texture coordinate and mapping node. And all we need to do is plug uh, instead of UV, we want to plug it into Window. And so now that is basically giving us the result that we want. Uh, if I do kind of raise it up and stuff, you will notice that uh, it kind of automatically updates to uh, the perspective and stuff. So what we actually need to do is bake the texture onto this. So what I'm going to do. Let's go back into edit mode and uh, we need some more geometry up there uh, because what we're actually going to do is use the geometry data and project uh, the texture onto it. And so without the data and stuff, everything is going to be all warped and everything. So let's go ahead. I'm going to hit control R to add a loop cut. And then using my scroll wheel, I'm just going to scroll up until I have, uh, you know, a decent amount of uh, loops right here. And then let's just do it the opposite way as well. So control R and then just scroll up until uh, I have a decent amount of actual geometry. And so now that we have that, you can see that we have all this geometry data and stuff that we can actually uh, work with. Uh, what I am going to do is uh, hit A to select everything. And again, I do want to be on frame 10. That's very important. Uh, now with that, we can go and hit U. And this is how you UV unwrap your object. And the nice thing is that we can actually project from view. And, the, uh, you know, we projected from view from the camera's point of view. And so with that, we basically have uh, the ability to use the camera as a projector of sorts. And so that uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense now because, uh, as you can see, we're viewing it from the window. And so wherever we're viewing it, it's going to kind of automatically update to that. 
uh, what we have to do is set it back to UV. And now we actually have uh, the UV uh, that we just created from the project from view actually projecting onto this thing uh, correctly. And so that is looking good. No matter which angle we are going to be looking at that from, is it, um, the texture is going to be accurate to the actual table. So that is uh, looking good. Let's go ahead and add some animation to uh, this thing. So I know at frame 10, I want the uh, location and the rotation to uh, be exactly here. So I'm going to hit I to add a location and rotation keyframe. And then we'll say at like frame 60, we want it to uh, raise up out of the ground and basically just float up. Uh, now you could get a little bit into the animation if you want it to be more realistic. You can maybe uh, have a hinge system where it rotates on the hinge and stuff like that. Uh, but again, I'm kind of making this kind of a whimsical, you know, unrealistic shot in itself. Uh, so again, let's G Z. I'm just going to move this up and let's set a location keyframe uh, right here. And then uh, I might rotate it, you know, 90 degrees as well. So let's rotate. Uh, so R Z 90 degrees like that. And then we have to set uh, a new uh, keyframe. So I R uh, for rotation right there. And now we basically have this effect. And uh, what I will notice is that we're having a little bit of an issue with uh, the kind of rotation right here. It's kind of clipping into some of the objects. And so what I could do is let's come back out to, uh, we'll go to the graph editor now. And if I pull this window up, I need to have this selected. And uh, we are rotating on the Z. And so let me just copy um, this frame, the Z rotation at frame 10. And then we're just going to paste it at frame 15. And so now you can see at frame 15, we're basically having a new uh, rotation uh, keyframe right there. So let's go back out to the timeline. And now you can see we have a new kind of separate keyframe, and that's going to be nice because this is just a rotation keyframe. And so let's uh, see how that looks. It actually looks pretty decent. Uh, but say now if I want to move around uh, this, you know, say I want to, it to immediately start rotating, I can do that. Of course, that is uh, causing some more kind of clipping issues and stuff down here. So I believe I'm just going to set it on frame 15. Again, that is just the rotation data, not the actual location data for that scene. Or sorry, that frame. And so now that we have uh, this kind of animation, this is looking pretty cool. Again, I'm just putting it, kind of making it float up here uh, out of our way. Uh, so now what I basically want to do is mess around with the inside and get a pretty cool effect where uh, there's this ball spinning in the water and actually causing ripples and all that stuff. Uh, so what I want to do is, uh, first of all, I just want to denoise my viewport for this part. And then uh, what I have to do, first of all, let's just get the texture of our port pool in. Uh, now, I just downloaded a texture from online, so make sure you go uh, check out that link and just download that uh, zip file and then extract the textures folder. And then once you have that textures folder extracted, we can go ahead and hit new. I'm going to make this material just called uh, the pool. And then, of course, over here, uh, we can have this principal BSDF. And uh, the nice thing about the node ringer add-on is it speeds up a lot of uh, material workflows. And so with this, we can hold uh, Control, Shift, and T. And that'll actually add, you know, open up the principal texture setup. And so with that, let's locate that textures folder that I had you guys download. Uh, so right here, we have the textures folder with all of our maps inside of it. So let's hit A to select all these and hit principal texture setup. So you might notice that everything is a little too, bit too big. And so first of all, we haven't really correctly applied the scale yet. And without getting too complicated into it, all we have to do is select the bottom here. And then I'm going to hold control and A and apply that scale. So now let's change it a little bit, but of course, it's still uh, too small uh, for our specific purposes. So let's uh, shift A. I'm going to add a value node over here so we can have one number to affect all of our scale numbers over here. Uh, and then let's just boost that up. It might be a little bit hard to see, and I actually want our pool to kind of be a white tiled look. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to unplug my base color up here um, to actually just be white. And also right here, just because of the texture and everything, is uh, that's actually to do with the displacement. We're not going to really deal with displacement in here, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that um, as well. Now you can see this is the texture that we're getting, and uh, you can play around with the tiles and get a, a result that you like, but this is pretty good, and uh, because we actually applied the scale, um, everything is uniform, and so these are actually square tiles like they would be uh, for the actual texture. And so that is looking uh, pretty good and, you know, pretty basic. Uh, that's basically where I'm going to leave it for the interior uh, material. Uh, next, let's worry about the water and get into the fun stuff of this tutorial. Uh, so the water, what we're going to do is we're basically just going to use uh, this dynamic paint section over here. So if I go to the uh, physics properties, we have this dynamic paint. And so first of all, let's make a new material, or sorry, a new object. So shift A, I'm going to add a mesh plane. 
And so this plane is basically just going to act as our water surface. And so I'm just going to position it exactly on the top here. So I'm hitting uh, 7 on my uh, numpad to go to the top view. Let's hit H to hide this uh, top kind of uh, animated object that we had. And so with our plane selected, what I want to do is I basically want to size it up and scale it exactly to our pool. And so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to bring this right here and we can uh, bring it there. Then let's hit S to scale, X to move it in the uh, X direction. And again, I do want to try to get it as close to the sides as possible because what's going to happen is that uh, we're actually going to uh, see ripples and it bounce off of the wall kind of realistically. Uh, so again, you do kind of want to spend some time and get it as close as possible. We can have a little overlap here um, because it, you won't notice it too much. Then let's hit S and Y just to scale it in the Y direction. And again, there's just a little bit of overlap there, but again, uh, not too big of a deal. Uh, so now this is the basic uh, kind of floor plane. I'm actually going to G and then Z move that down a little bit just so we have a little lip of our, our pool. And so uh, that is that. Let's go ahead and uh, texture that just a little bit. Uh, so if we go to render view, let's add a new material. I'm just going to name this water. And so, of course, if I'm doing water, uh, what we can do is turn the transmission all the way up. And then we can turn the roughness all the way down. And so it's basically a kind of water color right there. And I might also add a little bit of a blue uh, tint to it. Um, of course, this isn't the most realistic. Water actually isn't tinted blue in real life. It's actually uh, pure white. And so you can play around with it there and get a kind of, you know, result that you like right there. Uh, but this is good enough for right now. We can play around with this uh, as we go along. Uh, but now let's uh, talk about how we can add this dynamic paint physics, um, you know, property over here. Uh, so first of all, if I uh, click that and enable that, we have uh, two types. We have a canvas and a brush. Basically, the canvas is going to be wh uh, what we actually want to be our water. And then the brush is going to be, of course, the object that is going to be affecting the water and creating the ripples. So uh, for our water, we want this to be canvas and we want to add canvas. Now, the thing about uh, the dynamic paint section is it actually uses geometry to affect, um, you know, the ripples and stuff like that. So uh, right now with our plane, we basically have four vertices. And so that is not enough to actually create the ripples throughout our entire thing. So in order to get some of those back, uh, one caveat to this is that uh, since it actually creates a modifier up here, you don't want to use the subdivision surface modifier because that actually interferes with the physics simulation. So unfortunately, what we're going to have to do is uh, come over here, go to edit mode again, so hit tab, and then we're going to right click and subdivide. Now, if you open up this window down here, we can make the number of cuts, we'll say like 50 or something like that, maybe even higher. So like we'll try 75, uh, something like that. And so you can see it's real fine and a lot of geometry data there and so now that we have all that extra geometry data uh, that'll actually help us with the dynamic paint so if we come back to that physics uh, tab we have all this kind of information that you can play around with here the most important thing is that we need to set our surface type uh, from paint we need to set it to waves and so now uh, we can actually have um, our objects affect the uh, actual, you know, waves and the ripples of the actual uh, object right here. Uh, so, of course, we do need to add in our little ball that's uh, going to be spinning in the uh, kind of center there. Uh, so, of course, let's shift A. I'm going to add a mesh. We're going to do a uh, UV sphere. And then that is way too big. Let's just scale that down a little bit. And then I'm just going to go ahead and add some more geometry to it. So this is where we can come and add a subdivision surface modifier uh, just to smooth that out a little bit. So something like that. And then right click shade smooth. That is looking pretty good. And, uh, you know, the edges are curved. Again, the uh, subdivision surface mod uh, modifier does not work um, that well with the dynamic paint for some reason. So let's go ahead and apply that just uh, to make sure that uh, nothing is going to happen there uh, to where we glitch out or, you know, any bugs and stuff there. So let's go ahead and go to the physics properties. And now we basically need to add dynamic paint. Uh, but instead of canvas, we need to add it as a brush. Of course, nothing has happened because we actually just told it that the type is a brush. Of course, we do have to add the brush. And so let's hit that add brush uh, button right there. And now if we play uh, by hitting space and then G and then Z, you can see if I kind of move it up and down and it uh, interacts with the plane, it actually cre uh, creates ripples and uh, everything is looking there. Uh, good there so let's go ahead and right click and shade smooth uh, so that the ripples are a little bit more uh, high quality and stuff like that uh, this is where we can come back later and uh, subdivide it some more to give us more geometry for you know really fine uh, looking details in the water and so let's go ahead and uh, do a short little animation for it just so the uh, um, the circle is kind of constantly spinning so i'm gonna uh, g 
V, shift that down. And so I basically want it to be, uh, you know, in the water or something like that. And then in order to actually have it kind of rotate and spin around um, in a circle constantly, what I can do is actually affect our origin point. So if you see this little dot in the center, basically right now, if I R and then Z and rotate it, it's basically rotating around that origin point. So uh, what we want to do is we want to move that origin point to a different location so that it'll basically, once we set it to rotate, it'll actually rotate around in a circle. Uh, so in order to do that, let's go to tab. I'm going to hit A to select all of the geometry here. And then let's just hit G and then Z, or sorry, X to move it on the X axis. And I want to just move it a little bit out here. And now you can see since we're in edit mode, we've actually moved the geometry without moving the actual origin point. And so if we come out of... Um, edit mode by hitting tab now if we hit r and then z you can see it's actually spinning around each other uh, and so that is really nice and we can define you know how big that uh, diameter is uh, for the rotation by how far away uh, this is from the origin point in the center and so this is perfectly fine for what i'm going to uh, use it for so i'm just going to leave it like this so now back inside of edit or sorry object mode uh, let's just put it in kind of the center of our uh, pool right here. So somewhere like that. Uh, you do want to make sure it's not really um, going to the edges. So let's R and then Z, just move it, and it's not really touching the edges. So that's uh, really good. Uh, now what we can do to make it constantly spin, let's uh, bring uh, this window out over here. So hit N, and then I want to go to Item. And now we have this location, rotation, and uh, scale data, all of that stuff in our scene. So that is all looking good. What I want to go ahead and do is set a, uh, you know, some keyframes over here. So with this Z, uh, we're basically going to sp be spinning it in the Z axis. If you can see that number is changing once I rotate it. So let's go ahead and create an expression, which is basically just a code um, that we can write inside of Blender uh, so that this animation will repeat for forever. And so I'm going to do hashtag frame, and then we're going to divide it by a number to make it a little bit slower. So divided by, let's say, 15. And so let's play that animation. And so that looks pretty good and, you know, is actually creating ripples and, you know, bouncing off the edges. And you can see all these uh, ripples are, you know, realistically reacting. And now, of course, you can play around with a lot of the properties here. If you want the, uh, you know, speed to be faster, you would set this 15 number to be a lower number. So we'll set it to like five. And the reason uh, you don't want to do it too fast is because you can see it's creating a lot of, you know, ripples and stuff. And it might be uh, less realistic uh, depending on what you're going for. Uh, so we'll leave it at 15. So let me change it back. So 15, I believe, is what I used it for. And so that is looking good. Uh, let's go ahead and see what it looks like in rendered view. Uh, so we can see we have some ripples here. Uh, very important, uh, you know, you can see some kind of glitching and artifacting in some of these reflections. And that's to do with uh, how much geometry we actually have. Because when we shade smooth uh, this object, it actually doesn't shade uh, smooth the actual geometry. It's just kind of a cheaty, hacky way to do it. So what I'm going to do, since I'm close to rendering now, is let's go ahead and right click and subdivide. We'll just do it one time like that. So we have much more geometry inside of there. And so now you can see uh, the kind of curve and all that are much more accurate and uh, don't aren't as sharp as they were before uh, some of the reflections might glitch and stuff there uh, so that is all looking good um, and I didn't play around with any of the wave properties of the actual canvas over here but of course there are some stuff that you can do with the damping the spring uh, the smoothness all that kind of stuff uh, and so I won't really dive into that I'll let you guys kind of play around with uh, some of those values to get a result that you want uh, but this is looking pretty good what I want to do now is I basically want to create a um two separate passes that we're going to render out uh, to actually start compositing uh, the final shot in uh, now if i actually unhide our top plane uh what you might notice um like when i was testing i actually had uh the sphere you know poking through the top here so i basically just want to separate out the different passes and get um one where it's just this top kind of object uh pulling up and then the other pass is just going to be whatever is inside of here and so, uh, first of all, I noticed the lighting is a little bit too dark, so I'm going to go to the world properties, and let's just uh, increase the strength of it just a little bit here. Uh, now, the important thing that you'll have to know for this specific tutorial, since we are using uh, the actual kind of texture up here, is if I go ahead and set that uh, color management, because usually we like working with CGI inside of uh, AGX, the view transform, you'll see that everything is kind of desaturated. And so when we go back to combine it uh, in the final kind of composite, um, this color space is going to be the wrong color space uh, from the actual video clip. And so basically you'll notice that there's kind of a... Uh, 
difference in color uh, on this specific uh, part. And so we don't want that. We want, of course, this to act like it's actually being uh, physically lifted up and it blends into the scene uh, flawlessly. And so uh, in order to fix that, we do have to render this in standard. And all that to say is that sometimes standard isn't the best for high dynamic range. And so you do have to watch out uh, without, uh, you know, over exposing certain things so since we have like white objects right here it might uh, lead to certain uh you know overexposures in that regard and so what i actually want to do is let's go ahead and make a um you know this let's add a material to it so i'm just going to add a quick material we'll name that ball and we'll turn the roughness down just a little bit so we get a little bit more reflection there uh, now, I'm not going to be worrying about the reflection of the actual scene uh, since, you know, it's not too important since I'm not trying to make this uber realistic. It's kind of more of a uh, cool little uh, proof of concept scene. So now we have this result and it's looking really cool. Let's go ahead and break everything down into collections so we can uh, break it down into multiple passes. So I'm going to right click, create a new collection over here. Let's go ahead and create two. Uh, the first one I want to be top, and then the second one I want to be bottom. And so, of course, in the top collection, I want everything on the top of our surface to actually be in that collection. So the only thing here is our top object. And so if you remember, that's just our kind of base plate kind of, you know, going out here. And this is going to solve the issue that we're having here where our ball is actually peering through, um, you know, the surface up here. Uh, so next we need uh, the bottom collection. So let's go ahead and put every object in the bottom co collection, which is basically just uh, the every object besides the holdout object. And so we'll put that in the bottom here. The reason we're not doing the holdout object is because the holdout object we're going to be using for both both passes to actually hold out that um, you know certain area. And so we'll just leave that kind of out here with their camera. And usually uh, most of the times what I'll do is right click and do a new collection and I'll just do other right here. So I'll place the camera and hold out into the other collection. Uh, but really that's just for organizational purposes rather than uh, being able to actually combine them for multi-pass compositing. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and uh, add a new uh, view layer. So I'm going to name this one top and then we'll name the other one add new. I want to name this one bottom. Um, so for the bottom view layer, I only want uh, the stuff on the bottom to be enabled. If I actually go ahead and enable the top or disable the top, you'll see that we're not getting any of the shadows or reflections that we would have had if it would have been enabled. So instead of uh, clicking it off right here, what we can do is come into the filter section up here. And if we uh, toggle the indirect only pass, we can do those for each of the collections now. And so if I click that on, basically it won't be rendered. So everything in our top collection is not going to be rendered. However, everything it indirectly affects, such as shadows, reflections, ambient occlusion, all that kind of stuff, it's going to, uh, you know, still remain in our scene. So we can see the reflection of it right here. Uh, so that is exactly what we want. And let's go to the top section now. And now we basically want the opposite. We want everything in the bottom collection uh, to kind of act as our indirect pass. And so let's go ahead and enable that for the bottom collection. And we just have uh, this being rendered in our actual scene. Uh, so now that we have them uh, kind of separated, let's go in the compositing tab. Uh, now I'm going to be taking these into another project to actually composite them in. So let's get, delete the uh, movie clip in alpha over. Then I want to go ahead and select this uh, shifty, duplicate that down. I want to make this our bottom uh, view layer. And so now, of course, we have two our, our two separate ones. We have our top and bottom uh, view layers right now. Of course, we can't see anything because we actually haven't rendered out a single image yet. So uh, to do that, I'm going to come uh, first. Let me set my sample count. I'm just going to set it down to 1024 right here, and I am going to denoise it. Um, I actually found that the denoise thing at, up here has actually been updated to now include the albedo and normal. And so for now on, I'm just going to be denoising it with this little check mark here. And so that is all looking good. Let's come over here and render the image just to see the two different passes. Okay, so once it's black, uh, we can exit out of here. And now you can see uh, we have the two separate passes. Here is our bottom pass. You can see it's being affected by the shadow. However, we're not actually seeing that top uh, kind of lid object. And then, of course, we have the opposite of the lid, and it has motion blur and all that stuff uh, is looking really good. And so now we are actually ready to render these out and start our compositing process. So let's uh, add a sh so shift A, add a file output node. And this output node is basically the same as the composite. However, it allows us to have uh, multiple things rendered at the same time. 
And so to do that, let's come up to the node section. Let's go to properties, and then we can add another input right here. So I just need two inputs since we're rendering out two passes for this. So I'm going to name this one. We'll just name this top and then underscore underscore is just to separate the uh, kind of, uh, you know, text from the actual frame number that it's going to generate. And then we'll name this bottom or whatever you want to name it there. So I'm going to be saving it as PNG sequences. Uh, so you do want to make sure you have uh, whatever you save it as. It's, it has a alpha channel, so RGBA right here. Uh, you can also use OpenEXR is kind of the industry standard as well there. Uh, now, uh, PNG is actually a lossless format, and so um, with that, we don't need to play around with this compression uh, because that compression ratio is basically going to add a little bit of extra render time but lower file sizes without the uh, kind of you know loss of data and the loss of look and stuff. And so um, let's go ahead and, you know, set your base path wherever you want this to be saved, of course. And once we have all that, let's plug the top into the top and then the bottom into the bottom pass. And, of course, we have everything set up correctly. You do want to make sure um, normally, again, uh, we would be rendering with AGX. But, again, because of this top section, we do have to render in standard. And so now that we have that and uh, you have your base path saved, we can go and render the animation. So once those have rendered, we are actually ready to go into the compositing part of this tutorial. So we can go up to File, and then I'm going to hit New, General, up here. And let's go into Compositing and hit Use Nodes. And uh, since we're not going to be rendering anything in the 3D viewport, we can actually delete this Render Layers node. And I'm going to go ahead and import in all of my uh, different passes. So if I add an image node, uh, let first let's open up our footage. So here is that, just that image sequence. So I'm going to hit A, open the image, then let's Shift D, duplicate that down, and I'm going to open up my separate passes now. Okay, so here is my folder where I have the different passes. It does have both of them in the same exact folder. You can see that I have this ball and this top uh, pass separately. So what I need to do is I'll select this first kind of image in my ball pass, scroll all the way down until I get to the very bottom, and then I'll uh, Shift click that. And so I'm just selecting the last frame of the ball sequence and opening that image. And so this is all of our kind of bottom ball, um, you know, sequence I had before. Let's shift D, duplicate this. And now we just want the opposite. We want uh, the top pass that we had. So again, let's just select the first kind of uh, frame in that sequence. So top 10. And then we just scroll to the bottom to the very last frame, top uh, 189 for me. So let's open that image. Now we have everything in our scene. We have um, the actual top, you know, pass that we have. We have the bottom pass. And then we actually have uh, the table and everything. So that is looking really cool. And we are actually ready to composite. So first of all, we have to get in the right color space. Uh, so let's come over here. I'm going to go to color management. Again, it's set by AGX by default. Let's set it to standard. Uh, so now we can go ahead and shift A. I'm going to add a alpha over. And we pl plug that in there. We need to combine our footage. And then below that, we actually need or um, you know bottom pass and so the ones with the actual ball and so now you can see that that is combined if we go ahead and shift control click that and what you will see is there's this little white border around here and so that is to do with basically the pre-multiplication uh, basically this alpha isn't multiplied uh, onto our actual pass yet uh, and this is actually useful if you're color correcting and stuff like that you always want to do your color correction before you actually pre-multiply your alpha and so uh, we'll, for now, we'll just uh, convert pre-multiply like that in this uh, alpha over node. So that is looking good. Let's uh, shift D, duplicate this down. And of course, we want to place our top pass on, uh, you know, the very bottom, uh, because that's the thing that we want on top of everything else. So if I come to the earlier frames where the top would actually be here, uh, you can now see it's basically in front of our, um, you know, bottom layer right here. Okay, so that is all looking good, and you know exactly uh, how we have it. If you remember, we started the animation on frame 10, but as you can see, our uh, animation is starting on frame 1. And again, that's because um, we actually started at frame 10 uh, when I actually rendered out my own uh, footage. Instead of uh, starting at frame 1, as you can see here, uh, we have 109 uh, frames. We actually have 180 frames here. And so if you uh, did kind of render out those first uh, 10 frames, because I didn't really uh, specify that you don't have to worry about that clip um, however if you did set the start kind of keyframe to be frame 10 uh, then you will have to do this thing and so the, all that we have to do is just tell uh, blender that we want it to start on frame 10 again uh, that is just because my image sequences both uh, for the bottom and top pass uh, both started on frame 10 and so I didn't render uh, frames 1 through 10 uh, through 9 uh, in the actual uh, blender to save on render time and all that stuff 
Uh, but again, you shouldn't have to deal with that and just play around with that. The most important thing that we do have to make sure is that all of them are set to auto refresh because if they're not, they're basically going to act as still frames. And so uh, Blender actually does a pretty good job of, uh, you know, setting them automatically like that. Uh, so now we have uh, basically this result. We have uh, the thing actually going up. Everything is correctly motion tracked. And you can see uh, we have basically this result. Uh, now I do want to kind of increase the saturation and play around with the little bit of color here. So what I'm going to do, again, if you remember uh, when I was saying that pre-multiplication stuff, we want to do all of our cut color data before we actually pre-multiply everything. So let's turn this off. You will notice that we have that border again. Uh, then we can go ahead and shift A. I want to add a um, alpha convert node. And so if we add that in, and we want that to be, again, at the very kind of end of that thing, uh, you can see that we already have it set to uh, two pre-multiplied. So you can also do it uh, back to straight. So say if you, uh, this is kind of what's known as a straight alpha. And so uh, what we can do is since we're it's already at straight, we want it to go to pre-multiplied, we can go uh, select that. And so that is basically doing the exact same thing as a pre uh, node. But uh, the nice thing is that w uh, what we can do now is everything before this is what we can actually color correct. And so let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to shift A, add a uh, hue saturation value node, place that there. Let's increase the saturation. Uh, so just getting some more kind of blue values in there. So something like that, that looks pretty good. We can also increase the saturation just a tiny bit, so something like that. And you can even play around with the hue of the water if you want to change uh, the color. But I'm not going to uh, deal with that for this uh, specific scene. Uh, so that is pretty much all I want to do uh, inside of this. Uh, the motion um, the uh, motion blur is actually pretty all right, and the depth of field is uh, you know matches pretty decently to the scene. So I'm just going to keep it super basic uh, for this specific shot. So let's go ahead and get our final kind of rendered animation with visual effects in there. Uh, so I'm going to put uh, the image into the composite node. And then let's go ahead and go to the output properties. Since I am rendering with the composite node, we actually have to go to the output section right here. So of course, uh, you know, put it in a specific folder that you want it to save uh, the final render into. Uh, file format, you can choose really anything that you want. I'm going to be rendering as a uh, H.264 MOV file. And so let's go ahead and set that. I'm going to FFmpeg video right there. And then down in encoding, of course, I want it to be an MOV file format. So that is going to be quick time for me. You can, of course, uh, if you want it as MP4, you can do MPEG4. And then output quality, I always like to set too high. And so uh, H.264 is totally fine since I'm going to be uplo uploading this online. And so that's the uh, best kind of, you know, compression uh, codec for that. And so now that we have all that set up, we can go. Uh, finally, we need to set the final uh, frame range. And so we have 189 is our final frame range up here. So 189 right there. And uh, with all that set up, now we can finally go and render the animation. Okay, so here is the final result that we got from today's tutorial. Hopefully you guys got something similar or learned a thing or two on the way. I just love making shots like this to test out my skills and, you know, make a super interesting result super fast inside of Blender. Anyways, it'd mean a lot to me if you consider liking and subscribing as it will help me out with the YouTube algorithm. But anyways, thanks so much for watching and I will catch you in the next video.